Welcome back. I am here with Lori Williams again. If you haven't seen the prior episode, please watch that first and then you come to this one. But in the last episode, we talked about some of the applications of remote viewing, starting a remote viewing business, Lori's background growing up as a child with psychic abilities. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about an intriguing topic called time loops and how to use them to make your life better, or at least to anticipate or make better decisions today that will have or could have an impact on the future. Welcome back, Lori. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. It's great to be here. What is a time loop? So a time loop is actually has to do with the way that time works. And of course, we have tons of theories out there on how time works. But I, when I first started my remote viewing journey, I had never thought about time, I, other than the fact that I was very bad at managing it. And, you know, <laughs> never seemed to get anywhere on time. But I always thought of time as being very consecutive, you know, like this minute and then the next minute and the next minute, and very linear. So in our last interview together, I talked about being in my first remote viewing class with Lynn and Lynn saying, hey, you know, who can tell me what's in this envelope? And this guy raising his hand and saying, I think it's, you know, mountains and flowers and trees. And then Lynn had him pull the picture out and it was a factory, which have, you know, and then, and then later he was trying to look at what was glued down to the paper because the factory picture had been cut out from a magazine, which was two-sided and glued down to the paper. And later when he was looking at it, Lynn said, what? what's on the back side? And he said, mountains and trees and et cetera. And Lynn said, okay, you just ruined your session. Okay. So how did that work? And that that's actually a great example of a time loop. And we actually call that a CRV time loop where you're starting at one point in time and you're trying to see ahead into the future. Now, this guy didn't realize he was trying to see ahead in the future, but in actuality, when Lynn said, what's, what do you think is in this envelope? Mm -hmm. The guy's subconscious mind, which has access to everything that ever is or was or will be, shoots ahead in time to the moment when he's looking at the feedback, the picture, and shoots that information back through time to him. Okay, so instead of shooting him back, shooting, instead of moving forward to the moment that he pulls the picture out of the envelope and sees the factory, it shot him ahead to the moment where he was cheating kind of and holding it up to the light and trying to see what's on the other side of the factory photo. So then that's what got shot back through him, back to him through time. So that's called a time loop. And it's also has to do with what we call retro causality. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what retro causality can be. For example, let's say that I want to buy a new car. So mm -hmm. I go to the dealership and I'm trying to decide which car do I want? Do I want a small car that will get better gas mileage, that will be more efficient, that's and that's my favorite color of red? Or do I want this other car that has four-wheel drive and is a lot more, you know, it's going to be able to take me on the rough roads of New Mexico where I live and it's going to be a lot, you know, a lot more practical. And it's white, let's say. <laughs> So I'm trying to decide, well, do I want the you know cute little red car or do I want the practical white car? And I'm, I'm trying to make this decision and it's really hard. Let's say that they're both about the same price and maybe the same, maybe if they're used, they have the same mileage. How could I help myself make a better decision? Well, if I'm a remote viewer, I could sit down and I could literally do a session targeting myself a year from now. You know how they say hindsight's 2020? Mm -hmm. So I could target myself a year from now. And by then I will, I will know which car I like better, you know, or, or if I made a good choice, because I know we've all experienced buyer's remorse where you're like, dang, I should have gotten the other one. Or where you're like, boy, I'm glad I didn't get that one. Cause that one turned out to have major, you know, manufacturing defects in it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm targeting myself a year in the future. And I'm kind of just checking up on how do I feel about the car? And what is the description of the car I currently own? Now I say currently because all time is now, you know, if I'm moving a year in the future, it's not then it's now 
I'm now one year in the future. So it's now for me. And I'm checking up in with my, my future self. Lori, how do you like your car? <laughs> and what kind of car is it? And what are you using it for? And I'm getting enough information so that I can kind of understand which one I chose mm -hmm. and how happy I am with that choice. And then I can come back and make my decision. But the key to it is we've got to close the loop. So what I'm going to do is a year from now, I, thankfully, we have these great cell phones now where we can set an alarm a year from now. And I have the alarm goes off a year from now. Oh, yeah, I need to sit down and do a remote viewing session and target myself a year ago in the past, sitting in the dealership, trying to decide which car to buy. And I could then try to influence that choice. Because I know that my my year ago self, because I know that my year ago self is is right now trying to contact my present self, my or my future self. So it's a loop, and I can say, okay, okay, uh, Lori, buy the red little car, buy the sports car, whatever you know, whichever one. And I can really try to influence myself using techniques that we teach in the intermediate course. And so I can target myself back in the past, and therefore I'm kind of influencing my past choice. Because time is not linear, and it's not consecutive. It's happening all at once. So my future self can actually influence my past self. And we call that retro causality, which means I'm actually causing something to happen in the past, the future can create the past. And that's what usually just that sentence makes people go, Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, what the future can create the past? You know, and how, how do we do that? So we call that another thing we another term we use a lot in our remote viewing classes is the term called displacement. And so, for example, I had a student who called me and he said, hey, Lori, on Monday, I was trying to do a target. I was practicing my CRV and I kept thinking about the gargoyles on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And so I kept thinking about the gargoyles and I couldn't get them out of my head. But when I pulled my my target, when I pulled the picture out after I was all done, it had nothing to do with that. So I totally missed the target. So then on Wednesday, I decided I was going to do another practice target. And I did my whole session. And when I pulled the picture out, it was the gargoyles on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. So effectively, I viewed Wednesday's target when I was supposed to be viewing Monday's target. So we call that displacement because you're viewing the wrong target. You, and the thing about displacement is usually when it happens, and it happens to every single remote viewer that ever tries CRV, you usually view the wrong target exceptionally well. <laughs> you know, so the 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 temptation is to kind of get pretty excited about it and go, "Wow, I did a darn good job of viewing the wrong target." You know, but if you think about if you think about an archer with arrows, you know, shooting yeah. at a target. You know, if if the archer has, let's say that, let's say there are four targets set up and he's supposed to hit the bullseye in the one that's directly in front of him, but he misses and he hits the bullseye in the one next to next to that one. Mm -hmm. He still missed the target. He hit the bullseye, but he it's the bullseye of the wrong target. And so we're like, okay, so viewers are like, how do we deal with that when displacement happens? And the answer to that is that emotion is a reward to the subconscious mind. So any emotion, whether it's happy emotion or angry emotion or sad emotion, all of that, the subconscious mind kind of thrives on that. And if you think for a moment, just for the sake of this analogy of the sub subconscious mind being like a child, a small child, some children will misbehave just to get attention. Mm -hmm. You know, even a spanking is better than being ignored, for example, you know, so if you were to get real mad at yourself and go, darn it, I viewed the wrong target, nah, 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 and you get mad at yourself, that's still rewarding the subconscious. If you get excited and go, God, I nailed that target, even though it's the wrong target, I nailed it. I totally described those gargoyles on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. You're, again, rewarding the subconscious for viewing the wrong target. And so if you think of the subconscious as being a little bit capricious, and going, you know, Monday's target's kind of boring. I think I want to view Wednesday's target instead. <laughs> you know, that it's kind of a willful child. And the only way to train it is not to reward it when it does that. So for the guy who viewed Wednesday's target on Monday, the way for, for him to handle that when he realizes what happened, instead of going, oh, man, that's really interesting. I, you know, and getting all excited about it, he should go, 
doesn't matter and totally ignore it. Wednesdays was Wednesdays, Mondays was Monday. I'm scoring each one based on its own feedback. And I'm going to totally ignore that this happened. That's actually the way to cure it is to ignore it. We had another situation years ago with a viewer who was going to be part of a meeting that night. And and the assignment was go look at the, you know, do the target, do your summary and, you know, write up your summary and then look at your feedback and score your session and then bring your results to the meeting. And we're going to talk about it. That was the assignment. So while doing the session, she kept thinking, i I feel like it's when the plane crashed into the Pentagon on 9-11. Well, we would never give that to our students as a target. You know, unless we had advanced, really advanced students that were really used to dealing with all kinds of emotional stuff. But that is not a good target to give to students. We really tried to avoid any targets that could be harmful psychologically. You know, like we hear about teachers who give the sinking of the Titanic to brand new students walking in off the street for the first time yeah. or the blowing up at the Hindenburg. And we don't believe in giving that type of target to our students because it, it can be, they can really relate to someone at the target who's ex- in extreme distress or even dying, you know, and that wouldn't be healthy. So we always try to pick benign targets for our students, but this particular student became convinced The target is the plane crashing into the Pentagon on September 11th. Well, when she finishes everything and looks at the feedback, of course, it's not anything having to do with that. So she just goes, oh, well. And she goes and flips on the television. And there's a general talking about the plane crashing into the Pentagon on September 11th. So she gets very excited. She goes, oh, my gosh, that's why I viewed it. I knew I was going to turn on the TV and see this. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So she's taking notes on what he's saying. Then when the program ends, she runs over to her computer and she Googles the plane crashing into the Pentagon on September 11th, gets all kinds of information, goes and gets her summary in her session to see how accurate she was on that target. Well, that was the wrong target. That wasn't her target. So by getting all excited and looking things up on Google and taking notes and watching that program, she actually created a new target for herself. And so her future action and getting all excited and doing that caused her to view the wrong target in the past. That's retrocausality. Now, here's a crazy question. Let's say, using your car example, you bought the wrong color car that you weren't happy with. First, can you go back to yourself and tell yourself, buy the other car, and if time were to change, would you even notice? Here's what we feel about that, because everyone asks that. I had a really sad situation recently where, I mean, just someone on on you know on a, on one of our Facebook groups wrote and said, "I lost my child. Can I can I somehow change change time and warn myself so I don't so I don't let those this thing happen, this terrible thing happen?" And it just broke our hearts, you know, to read this because, you know, I can't think of anything more painful than losing a child. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could have said, yeah, you can totally change that and make it not happen. But unfortunately, no, it's set the way things are set up in our reality are set up in such a way that it's almost like a valve, like a heart valve. Heart valves only flow open one way because they don't want regurgitation happening, right? We don't want that flowing the back, back way. And so we can't constantly change time because then whatever reason we are here for, whether we're here to learn lessons or whatever, we would constantly be undoing lessons that we need. And this may sound very upsetting for some people, but you know, I had to come to terms with this in my own life where some things happen that are extremely painful and you wish you could undo them. You just wish you could somehow make them not happen. But at the same time, sometimes that very suffering, that very pain is what teaches us compassion or teaches us lessons that we couldn't learn any other way. Mm-hmm. You know, so I believe that now you can't change the past, but what you can do is if you were to do this on a regular basis where you're moving forward in time, trying to connect with your future self, and then making sure to keep the appointment and your future self is there to catch the ball, so to speak, and then send back information, right? That's what completes the loop. Mm -hmm. If, If you were to do that on a regular basis, you could effectively improve your choices and your decision making over time because it would become like a practice, like a muscle that's getting worked. And you would be able to, you know, continually make better choices and better choices because you get better at hearing your 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 future self counseling you or, or trying to influence you. You get better at hearing it. And then you go, okay, 
I think I should do this. I bought a motor home once. We had sold a home, made some money from it, you know, not a lot, mm-hmm. but like I can't remember twenty, thirty thousand dollars extra. And instead of just putting that in savings, which is probably what I should have done, I I I wanted to buy a motor home. <clears throat> so we run and we buy this used motor home. And later I found out that, you know, I could have bought that exact same motor home for much less if I'd taken a little more time and shopped around, you know, but I was all eager. And I ended up buying this motorhome. And then I did have buyer's remorse. And I was like, darn it, I'm a remote viewer and I know how to do all this stuff. How come I didn't, you know, how come I didn't take the time to do that? And it really taught me a good lesson because, you know, it's like, it's almost like sitting on a on a treasure chest full of gold going, I don't have any money. <laughs> you know. And, and when when we've got the answers right at our fingertips and we're, you know, we're not availing ourselves of these amazing skills or whatever. So well, it can also, so it sounds like you have to initiate it now in order for it to work in the future, right? If you don't initiate it in the present, then it doesn't, it's not going to work backwards. Exactly. Because, you know, for example, if if I just walk into the dealership and say, okay, I want that one and I buy the car and I drive it home. And then a year later I go, you know, I really don't like this car. I wish I'd bought a different one. I'm going to influence myself in the past. You know, no, there's nobody answering the phone on the other end. Is the is the problem, you know? So it's got to be a, a chosen thing that you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Now we have yeah. had instances, we've had occurrences that made us think that our future selves was, tr- you know, was trying to get a hold of us, was trying to talk to us, you know, and trying to help us. How, and, how do you know? We don't know for sure, but there's there are some indications, and that's the that's kind of the conclusion that some of us have drawn. I'll give you an example. And you've interviewed Lynn Buchanan, so I don't know if he mentioned this to you, but is this the lottery? Um, the lottery? No, no. It was when okay. uh, you know, right after I met Lynn, I guess about a year after I met him, he and his wife decided they were sick of living in Maryland and they wanted to go. They always wanted to live in the Southwest somewhere, so they just topped in their car and got on I forty and start driving west from Maryland just to see what they could find. And uh, they stopped in Amarillo and we had lunch together and and then they kept going and they stopped in Ruidoso, New Mexico. Some people say Ruidosa, but <laughs> Ruidosa. But I, I have I speak with a Spanish accent because I speak Spanish fluently. And so it's called it's actually Ruidoso. So they, they stopped in Ruidoso and um, they found a house they liked and they decided to buy it. And they went in to do, I think, the the earnest, you know, to put down the earnest money and, you know, how you do that. You sign an initial contract that says, I'm interested in this house. Let's see if we can come, if we can make a deal. And here's some earnest money. And they sat down to do this and, and they were going to sign the contract when Lynn felt a slap on his forearm that just as he was getting ready to sign it, he feels a slap and it jerked his hand back. And he thought that was weird. You know, like, what was that? And the first thought that came to him was that was me telling me not to sign this contract. So he looked at his wife and he said, let's, let's just take a little bit. Let's look a little bit. Let's look around a little more before we do this. And she said, okay, she, she had learned to trust him on, on these things. He, so they walked out and they kept looking and they came to Alamogordo, New Mexico, and they found a gorgeous home that was so much nicer than the other one. And Lynn made the owners who were caught up in a divorce, you know, and, and, had, and the house had apparently been for sale a while. And he made them a lowball offer thinking they would never take it. And they snatched it right up. They took it instantly. Then he was like, darn, I should have even offered less. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, so then when he signed that contract and they closed on that house and he knew this is definitely the right house, you know, for sure. Then he did a session and he targeted himself back in that other office getting ready to sign that paper. And he hit his own forearm back several times as he was connecting with himself, you know, is that remote viewing or is that PK capability? No, that's not PK because PK is when, when something moves by itself. So for example, yeah. So so that's what I was talking about. The arm, like some, no, he's literally hitting himself. Oh, I get it. He's hitting his own arm, but he's connecting with himself in the past so that his past self feels it. Does that make sense? So as he was getting ready to, to, Signed it, he felt a slap on his forearm, but it was coming to him from the future. And so he wanted to make sure and close that loop 
and tell himself, don't buy that house, you know, and, 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 and cause that. Who knows how these things work? Who knows if that even had anything, any bearing on anything? Maybe the Maybe the feeling of something slapping his forearm was a complete fluke and it had nothing to do with anything. And maybe his going in, the, you know, sitting down and targeting himself back there and doing that, you know, maybe it didn't didn't do anything. It's just that there have been several incidences like that where we kind of feel mm-hmm. like our future selves are really are really are trying to communicate with our past selves and, and get through to us. Kind no. of like in, in that movie with Matthew McConaughey, Interstellar. Like in that movie, because he he realized he was trying, his future self was trying to communicate with his past self in the movie. Now, so most of the examples, if not all the examples you've given me, are based on very clear, discrete decisions that have to be made. What about more open-ended questions? Like, let's say somebody's going through a hard time and they just don't know what direction to take or if things are going to get better or what they're going to be doing you know, five, Mm -hmm. a year, a year, five years, 10 years down the line. Does that time loops work for that? And if they do, how would one structure that sort of a time loop? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And we've actually done exercises like that concerning that with students too, because we really want CRV to be practical for our students to Mm -hmm. give, to give, you know, for them to be able to use it in their daily lives. So I asked the students, bring a question that you have to the next meeting that we're going to have. And so one guy brought a question and he said, okay, I'm currently working at my job and I'm wondering if I should, I'm thinking about maybe opening my own business, you know, in the same genre in which I'm working or whether I should maybe accept a a job offer that I got from a, a competitor across town. So my choices are stay in my job that I'm in move across town and accept a position with a competitor or open my own place. Which of these three should I choose? So that was his question. And I said, okay, what's your criteria? And he's like, what do you mean? Craig? What do you mean by criteria? I'm like, well, first of all, like what is, why would you, why would you even be thinking about changing jobs? Why are you thinking about changing jobs? Are you unhappy where you are? Do you want more money? Do you want to be happier? Do you want to feel more fulfilled? So you have to do some digging. We think a lot of times, I just want to ask this question, but the question is not what it appears to be on the surface. Mm-hmm. The real question is, where will I be happier? Or well, where will I make more money? You know, that sort of thing. The interesting thing about that particular question is that it was in late 2019 that we were doing this. And I have this one gift that. I can kind of reach forward in time and kind of feel things. And I instantly, as soon as he asked those three questions, I knew that shortly all three questions would be irrelevant. I didn't know why. I didn't check out why because I was just kind of an instant knowing. But I didn't want to tell him that because I, I often feel like it's not good often to reveal the future to people. Because we we are on a trajectory for a reason and we've signed up for certain lessons and, and it's not really like, I'll give you another example. My son. And by lessons you, you taught, this is kind of the earth school model. Exactly. The earth school idea that we're, why are we in this reality? Why are we in these bodies? You know, why do we choose the people we choose to have relationships with, you know, et cetera? You know, well, no one really knows. We have theories, but I personally feel like we are definitely here to grow in some way. So when I asked him that, I said, okay, so what are your reasons for wanting to change? And then what are your time frames? Like which job will provide more fulfillment over the next five years or 10 years or one year or whatever your time frame is? Or which job will I make more money in? Or which job will I be ultimately more happy with? five years from now, which of the three guys I'm thinking about marrying, will I be the happiest with, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now or whatever, you know? And then sometimes you even have to get down to what does happiness mean to me? What is happiness? You know, or what, you know, what is contentment? What is abundance? What is prosperity? You know, we think we we know the meanings of these words, but then we have to really dig deep and say, but what does that mean to me? You know? Because what what I what I consider to be what makes me happy might not be the same thing that makes you happy, right? right? You know, so we have to dig down and think about those things. It's pretty profound when you think about it. 
And so then we we had another one who said, well, I, I have this job and my girlfriend helped me get this job. And I've been working at this job for 14 years. Well, actually, no, the question was, should I quit my job? Yeah. So the surface question was, should I quit my job? <laughs> and I said, well, why do you want to, how, first of all, how long have you been working at your job? 14 years. Okay. Why is it a question? Like, are you really unhappy at your job? Actually, I have never really liked this job very much. Oh, okay. Well, why have you stayed 14 years? Mm-hmm. Well, because my, my best friend helped me get the job and I, and I work with my best friend and I don't want to disappoint her. And I'm worried that it might affect when we really came down to it. She was afraid to quit the job because she was afraid it would destroy her friendship with her best friend. That was the, that was the crux of it, but she really wanted to quit. You know, so when you get down to the crux of things, then you can, you have to be sure that you're asking the right question, right? And that's the thing. That's the trick. You know, what is the right question to be at, that I should be asking? Okay. So last, last question. Are there any warnings about using time loops or using time loops inappropriately in a way that can be damaging or harmful? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. Well, I mean, I can't. I haven't really thought about any dangers, and I and we've been doing this for years and years and years, and haven't had any kind of negative things come up. So I don't really think there's any warnings. The only thing that you know I think is an obvious thing is that, like, let's say that I say, well, you know, I'm I'm thinking I'm trying to make this decision. Should I make this decision? Yes or no? And then you you say, well, I'm going to check with myself, my future self, and you try to move, let's say, ten years into the future. But in in your destiny, it's actually meant for you to die tomorrow, you know, by getting hit by a car or something. And and you're checking into the future. And it's like uh, the phone's ringing, but nobody's home. You know, <laughs> it's like you know what I mean. That's, that's happened. That, that's happened. No, I'm just saying that okay. it's something I've I've thought about. Yeah. Like you know, when you're thinking like, is there any downside to doing time loops? I'm thinking. Well, the only thing I can think of is if you were to try to reach forward in time to connect with your your future self on this planet to get an answer that's very concrete about something earthly and your future self is no longer on this plane you know to connect with you know does how does that work you know and, and can you uh, there, connect? there's so many yeah there's so many possibilities, possibilities. exactly you could end up connecting with your higher self exactly and we right. do connect I, I really do feel that you can connect with your higher self to get a lot of answers. And I I believe that throughout my life, there's been a lot of times when my higher self has saved me, you know, from, from certain death or in you know, a very, very dangerous situations. And so I, I had a situation once just as, just this is kind of a fascinating story. So I was a missionary and this was way before I ever heard of remote viewing. And I was a missionary and I was, I was actually working in Houston, Texas, and so Houston has some major highways with lots of lanes, you know, big super highways with like six lanes. So I was I was with these two boys and we were hitchhiking. I was 17 years old and we got a ride. These two black kids picked us up and they were in a little tiny car. And so we're the three of us are scrunched into the back seat and I'm in the middle, I think. And so and so we're all scrunched into the back seat and we're on this super highway, you know, going really fast and all the cars are moving at the same speed. And I suddenly hear this voice in my head. It wasn't an external voice. It was an internal voice, but it was the clearest I've ever heard anything in my life. And it was a very pleasant, mature female voice, like maybe mine is now. I don't know if it's pleasant, but you know, it was a very mature female voice. And the voice said, there's going to be an accident. And I immediately tensed up because what? You know, I hear this voice in my head saying, there's going to be an accident. And you kind of go, what? And then the voice was very calming and said, but don't worry, no one's going to get hurt. But as soon as the the car comes to a stop, you and the boys need to get out and run away as fast as you can. I mean, it was just clear as a bell, the instructions. And right after the, the sentence finished, the guy driving got mad at something, somebody pulling in front of him or, you know, passing and getting in front of him or something. He got irritated. And so he slammed on the gas and said, I'm going to scare this guy. He slams on the gas and goes jutting forward and actually crashes into the guy in front of him. But then he completely loses control of the car and he starts careening across the lanes to the left, crashing into cars as he goes, and then careening across the right, crashing into a bunch of cars going to the right, and he crashed into the guardrail. So 
I tell the boys, and it's all kind of bumper crunches. It's not like major smashes, right? So I tell the guys, we've got to get out of the car right now. And they just listen to me. I don't know why. So we jump out of the car, we climb over the guardrail, and we went running down this embankment and ran away, you know? And then when we got to our place where we lived, you know, we were like, why did that happen? What what happened and why did it happen? And I told them how I'd heard the voice and everything. And the other guy said, well, <clears throat> they had sawed off, a sawed off shotgun under the under the seats. I saw the sawed off shotgun and it scared me. And I was thinking, who are these guys? Where are these guys taking us? You know, and what are they planning to do? And he had been feeling like these guys are planning to take us somewhere and kill us. You know, that was his sense the whole time we were in the car. And so it was kind of interesting because we were just, you know, it just felt like the whole thing was all kind of engineered to save our lives, that there was something that we were going to get killed by getting, by being being in that situation. So I've always remembered that, though, and felt like, was that my guardian angel? Or was that my higher self? Or who was that that, that told me that? Well, so maybe clearly. you should send a message back to complete the loop, right? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I should I should talk to myself there in the car and say, yeah. this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> because it did, it definitely, we did definitely... All the cars started pulling over, you know, after that accident happened. I don't know why we had to run away so quickly, because you would think with all the cars pulling over, we would have been relatively safe. But I don't, who knows, you know, who knows what would have happened had we not run away? I don't know. But, but it was just you and your compa- you and your companions, not the not yeah. the people who picked you up. Who were- right. Just the two of them, just the, those two guys and, and, and me. In fact, we ran away so quick. I don't even think the guys who were driving us realized well, they were still in kind of shock and like, uh oh, what's going to happen now? You know, and so I, I don't think they even realized that we were running away until we were probably too far to, for them to catch. <laughs> or may, or maybe they were just going to get, you know, when the cops arrived to investigate the accident, they'd find the sawed off shotgun and you and your friend would have been implicated in a weapons yeah. charge. I mean, it could have been, could have been as simple as that, right? It mm-hmm. So, yeah. All right. Well, Lori, it was a pleasure talking to you today, and I look forward to talking to you in the next episode. Sounds great. Thanks, Sean. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.